There's nothing like the fellowship of those who love the Lord. So welcome to family. There's always room for more. When I count my blessings, it's easy to see. My brothers and sisters, that mean so much to me.
Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light with the angels. Let us sing. Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Uh, one of the things that makes Christmas uh, that we kind of a staple of Christmas are the Christmas songs, Christmas carols. And one of the uh, popular ones is Joy to the World. Uh, Isaac Watts uh, was the author of the song Joy to the World. He wrote over 750 songs. And uh, He's, he, one, a couple of things that he wrote, a couple of songs he wrote that you might be familiar with are uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and At the Cross. And uh, Isaac Watts, when he's writing hymns, uh, grew up in the age where he could not write a song unless it was a, a psalm from the scriptures. And so Isaac Watts was one of the very first guys who wrote uh, songs that he wrote from his Christian experience. And uh, so he wrote... Joy to the world. It's interesting that joy to the world, you'll not see the words, it's a Christmas song, but you'll not see the words uh, manger, uh, shepherds, wise men, because he never wrote that as a Christmas song. Uh, he wrote that talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what he wrote about. And so, uh, but he wrote joy to the world, and it's uh, kind of taken on as a staple of Christmas song. Uh, the words go like this. I know you know, but let me just kind of read it. It says, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Heaven and nature sing. The second verse goes, Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. And so I'm just going to take the idea of joy to the world and just look at Luke chapter 2 and just kind of draw a couple ideas out of it, and uh, then we'll be done. So look, look at Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It says, uh, And the angel said unto him, them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall to be all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then that verse, it talks about great joy and the connection of joy to the world. And, uh, you know, we try to uh, like to think that Christmas is a great time of joy. We try to make it a, a time of that's fun, festive, uh, joyful time. Uh, some of the aspects of Christmas can be joyful, some of not so much. Uh, traffic, uh, things like that. And so, like uh, I was telling the church today, like putting up Christmas lights, that cannot be joyful sometimes. Uh, I, I, I told them, I said, I read a story the other day about a man who fell off his ladder in September while putting up Christmas lights. Here's how the story went. True story. He lost his balance as his wife was on the ladder trying to hand him his walker. <laughs> Something's wrong with that picture right there. And uh, so that's not a joyful time. That, it, it, something can turn sour and, and Christmas may not be joyful at that moment. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we try to uh, make joyful Christmas time, but it doesn't always seem that way. Uh, somebody surveyed some people come out of a mall and they asked them, give me one word that describes Christmas for you this year. Here's some of the words, it's kind of disturbing. Uh, overrated, stressful, lonely, lame, commercialism, tension, panic, anxiety. And now those are, I'm sure they pulled out all the good ones and put these on there, but it tells you some of the ideas that people have about Christmas. It's not always as great as it seems sometimes. But yet the scriptures tell us it's joy to the world. It says, be joy to all people. And so there's a conflict here that we see. And so, uh, where does the joy come from? And that's what we're going to look at today. Where does the joy come from at Christmas time? Somebody wrote this. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, it says this, if joy of Christmas means family, then where is the Christmas joy for a person who's just lost a loved one or has no family? If the joy of Christmas means shopping malls, Christmas trees, and blinking lights, then where is the Christmas joy for a family who lives in a remote village in the hills of Ghana 
that has no electricity, let alone a shopping mall, and has never seen a Christmas tree. If the joy of Christmas means giving and receiving gifts, then where is the Christmas joy for the single mother of four, working two jobs, barely having enough money to pay the mortgage, keep the heat, and put the food in the refrigerator? If joy of Christmas means white snow falling from the sky and covering the ground and, and bare the, uh, tree limbs, then where is the Christmas joy for a person who lives, well, in Oklahoma? Uh, we have no snow. Uh, and so we go to the verse, look at verse 10 again. It says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. So what they're saying is what happens at the birth of Jesus Christ will be joy for all people, but yet we put our joy, it seems like, in different things, but yet we kind of miss it when the Christmas story, what it's talking about here. So where does joy come from in the Christmas season? It's just going to be a couple of thoughts and we'll be done. Number one, joy is knowing that God, that God keeps his promises. Look at verse 11. It says this, For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It says, he's saying, hey, this baby Jesus is going to be born this day. He's making a prediction saying it's going to happen. Aren't you glad that God keeps his promises? Um, all the way driving up here, we're driving and the clouds look terrible. I mean, just, it could have rained. It looked like it could have rained all the way up here. We only saw rain for a little bit part of the way. But you see a, a rainstorm cloud and it's always dark and it always looks like it just dropped a bunch of rain, but never delivers rain. Don't you know there's a lot of people like that? They... They, deliver prom they say they promise something, but they never deliver a promise. Um, a parent promises the spouse, I'll do this, but never delivers on the promise. A parent uh, delivers a promise to a child, but never comes through on it. A friend breaks a promise to a friend. Companies break a promise to an employee. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Politicians won't even go there, okay? Won't even go there, all right? But don't we see all the time where people break promises all the time? But yet, isn't it good to know that we have a God that keeps his promise? He says there'll be a baby born on this day, and guess what happens? A baby, Jesus, is born on that day. We can look right past that, but God keeps his promises. That's encouraging. And what's also encouraging is this. In the first part of the Bible, in Genesis, chapter 3, after uh, Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden and the sin came in, there was a promise made that one day a Messiah will come and deliver people from their sins. Made a promise way back in Genesis chapter 3, and guess what? That promise came to be. Once again, because we have a God that keeps his promises. Uh, also, it go, we can go back to Isaiah. Don't turn there, but let me just read it. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Did that come to be? Absolutely. A God keeps his promise. Also, in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 9 says, For unto us is a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Once again, over and over, the word of God always, and God keeps his promise. Throughout the whole Old Testament, prophecies were spoken about Jesus Christ, about his birth, what he would do, his teachings, how he would die. And over and over again, God has been seen as who one who keeps his promise. And so we can say that we serve a God that keeps us. And we can have joy in that. Number two is this. Joy is knowing that you matter to God. Uh, verse 11 again. For unto who? You. Is born this day. The angels made an announcement to the shepherds. The shepherds, as you know, were the outcasts of the group. They were the ones who were never, ever included in anything. They were just the outcasts. Had no reputation at all. Had no say in court. Had nothing to do with people. And they're the outcasts. And yet the angels of God come and report the angel or the uh, birth of Jesus Christ to shepherds. Why? Why the outcasts? Because I think God wanted us to let us know that everybody matters to him. Everybody matters to him. You know, I was, I was telling our church today about this. I said, I want, you ever think about what, what it was like in heaven before Jesus came to earth? You know, I, I was thinking about this, and uh, you think about heaven before Jesus came to be born, and the Jesus who lived in a place of heaven where peace and joy and love and worship is continually flowing out of that place. And he chose willingly to leave that place the place that people are wanting to go to. He leaves there to come to earth. 
And when he comes to earth, what does he get? Once he's born, the king wants to kill him. Merry Christmas. There you go. And then he's born to a, a couple, Mary and Joseph, who at the time was a big scandal. She was a pregnant teenager, unwed at the time. And the scandal is brewing, I'm sure, in the community about those two. And so he's born into a family where there's a scandalous, and the king is trying to kill him. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just his situation when he was born was really a mess. So you think about it, he left heaven that all heaven had to give. He left heaven and came to be born into this world. And what did he get in return? Think about it, what he got in return. He was mocked, humiliated lied about, put on a, a cross, that's what he got in return. And you ask yourself, why would you do that? Would you give your life, would you leave heaven to give your life to be born in this world for somebody who's going to be unloving towards you? Most of us say no, but love does. That's what love does. Does something that's uncomfortable, that's uncharacteristic of anybody else. And Jesus left heaven. I, I, I saw about this the other day. I said, I wonder if God had to hold the angels back from following Jesus to earth. You know, think about it. The angels who served Jesus and who worshiped Jesus the whole time, he leaves heaven and goes to earth. I wonder what the attitude of the angels were. I mean, I wonder if they just wanted to go and join him there because, you know, they spent their whole eternity with him. And all of a sudden he's leaving and all of a sudden, you know, had to hold. I just wonder what it's like in heaven. That he actually left his throne, laid down his rights to be treated as God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and was born in a manger in a feeding trough to a young lady and a young man. Why does he do that? Because you matter to him. You matter to him. He cares that much for you. I don't know about you, that blows me away. That does. It blows me away. I love that deep. I love that strong. I love that powerful that he cares that much for me and for you, that he would do that for me. Because today, I mean, just as today's society, we just live in a throwaway society. We really do. I mean, when you can abort a million babies a year, you live in a throwaway society. You just do. Divorce, throwaway society. We just live in a throwaway society. Outcast, boom. It's no problem. And here, uh, we come and see Jesus Christ, and yet his whole ministry, if you look at his whole ministry, he always focused on the, a lot of times the needy, the uh, outcast, the people who everybody else threw away. Jesus was always spending time and attention on them. You know what? We were that people. In our sins, sinners, the outcasts, we had nothing to gain. I mean, he had nothing to gain by loving us, but yet he loved us in spite of who we were. Because love, that's what love does. It blows me away that God loves me and Jesus loves me that much. Number three is this. True joy is by the, nat the natural product of a close relationship with Jesus Christ. When you have a close relationship with Jesus Christ, there is a natural byproduct of joy. It, it just goes hand in hand. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you participate in that relationship and you... Um, surrender yourself to him and you uh, want to grow in him, there's a natural byproduct of joy in that relationship. There just is. Uh, I'm not saying every day is a fantastic, everything's snow, uh, flowers and bunnies every day like that, but I'm just saying there is a joy that surpasses cir circumstances in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody said this, amid a flood of techniques of self-fulfillment, there's an epidemic of depression, suicide, personal emptiness, escapism through drugs and alcohol, cultic obsession, consumerism, and sex and violence, all combined with the inability to sustain deep and enduring personal relationships. They're all looking for something. And what the connection is, a relationship, a deep relationship with Jesus Christ brings joy. Let me just read you a couple of verses. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit which is the evidence of the Spirit of God working in you, is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So what he's saying is this. If you have the Spirit of God in you, and he's active and vibrant inside of you, you should be flowing out of you love and joy. 
because it's just a natural byproduct of a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you. Why? Why do you say that? Because that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. He says, hey, listen, you want joy? You have a close relationship with Jesus Christ and with God. He goes, a natural byproduct will be joy. So what we know is this. We know that from the birth of Jesus Christ, the joy that goes to all people is not the Christmas lights and the Christmas trees and all that kind of stuff. It is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's knowing that you matter to God. That he loves you that much that he would give his own son to be born in a manger, to die on a cross for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins. That is how you can have joy the Christmas season. Last one's this. Joy is knowing that your past can be forgiven. I, I love this part. Let's just read verse 10 and 11 again. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, not rich, not young, not old, but to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Our greatest need, my greatest need this Christmas is not, a, it hurts me to say this, is not a 70-inch TV. Though I'd love to have one. I think that'd be fantastic. Wink, wink. All right, and to my wife. Love to have one with a remote that only works to my hand, all right? That would be fantastic, but that's not my greatest need. My greatest need was a deliverer to save me from my sins. That was my greatest need. What's confusing is the world looks around today and they think my greatest need is a house, a car, a relationship with somebody else. Uh, whatever, you can name it, fill in the blank with whatever it is. They think that's their greatest need, but they don't understand what they need as a savior. They need a deliverer, that's what they need. Because when they sinned against God, it broke that relationship with them and God. And they are searching over and over again for something to fill that void. Something to fill that. And Jesus goes, I came to be your deliverer. He says, I came to be the deliverer for all mankind. That's why I came. I didn't come to sing Christmas carols too, though those are nice. I didn't come so we can all give gifts, and that's nice. I came to be the deliverer, the rescuer for all mankind. And haven't we got it mixed up sometimes? I mean, I love the gifts and the presents. I do. I enjoy that. Matter of fact, we're going to leave here and do the family thing with all the gifts and presents, and I enjoy that. Have I said I enjoy that? I enjoy that. I love the food. I love the family. I love all this stuff. But the thing is this. We cannot forget the priority of it all, which Jesus Christ being born to be my deliverer, your deliverer. I mean, that's just what it is. He came to rescue her. To be a rescuer, to deliver for all mankind. In 2010, uh, and a matter of fact, a movie was made of it. Uh, in Chile, uh, a, a mine collapsed on a bunch of miners. Remember that story? Ever heard that story? And uh, so what happened was this mine collapsed on all these uh, miners. And actually 17 days, 17 days passed and because they couldn't get to them. They thought they were all dead. It took them 17 days to drill down to get a message to the miners. And they asked him through the message, how is anybody alive? A message came back, says, we're in a shelter, 33 miners still alive. It actually took all the equipment and all the work and operation, a rescue operation began. And it took all this work, all these people working together to rescue those miners. And it took them 69 days that those guys were down in the ground, waiting for rescuers to come. But isn't that a picture of us? Haven't we been trapped in the darkness of our own sin? And aren't you glad that Jesus started a rescue mission? Because if we didn't have a rescue mission from Jesus Christ, no one else could fulfill that, could he? No one else could, because he's a savior. He's the savior. He's the deliverer. He's the rescuer of all mankind. And like I said, people go search for everything, every way, every possible to enjoy Christmas, somehow, some way. But if you don't go back to the first mean of Christmas, which is the birth of Jesus Christ, because he's the rescuer of all mankind, we have missed the whole picture. So like I said before, 
It's nice to enjoy Christmas. I enjoy it. I enjoy having Parker Grace around. She adds a little, little excitement to our family. We're a little laid back, if you may not know. But when we, she comes in the room, things light up. And when I say that, she might start the house on fire. Things light up, all right? She's crazy. And she enjoys Christmas. She enjoys unwrapping things. And I'll give this. Victoria lo- uh, loves Christmas. She loves wrapping everything else and getting the toys and the presents. She loves it. And I love that too. But if all we teach Parker is about gifts, we've missed the boat. You know, I was telling people at our church, I said one of my prayers for Parker is that when she grows up, she's the voice for God in her generation. That she becomes a voice, a great voice for God in her generation. Because her generation, tough generation, isn't it? Tough generation. Uh, New numbers come out about the millennials and how their feelings are towards religion and towards God and towards Jesus Christ. And the numbers keep on stacking up higher about they're just non-religious, non, non-Jesus, non all the kind of stuff. But you know what? If we can raise up a group of people that say, hey, you know what? I want to be a voice for God in my generation. Boy, I tell you, if God has that kind of people, things can happen. That's why we spent buku dollars on re- renovate, renovating our n- existing uh, sanctuary uh, into a kid's auditorium because we value kids, because God values kids, because we just want these kids to grow up with the foundation that Jesus Christ is everything to them, that they understand that it's, life is more than just things. Life is more than just the temporal, that there is the eternal side of our life. We want them to know that at a young age. Don't you wish, don't you wish you'd have saved yourself some of the heartache and you did in your life and just followed Jesus from the get-go? Don't you wish that? No one else ever have any heartache in their life before they really seriously followed Jesus Christ? Am I the only one? Come on, give me some help here. But isn't it true, though? If we can just focus on raising our kids, our grandkids, and also, you know how they know that? We model that. Jesus Christ is our everything. He is our source of satisfaction. He's our source of everything. Everything else fades away if we put Jesus Christ in the perfect center of our life. So where does joy come from? Does it come from the Christmas tree, from the gifts? Happiness does, but not joy. Joy comes from Jesus Christ, a relationship with him, knowing that he matters, that you matter to him, that he forgave you of your sins, that he loves you enough to leave heaven and come to earth so that you can have forgiveness of your sins. If you got nothing else for Christmas, that was worth everything, wasn't it? That you have eternal life in heaven, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's worth gold. That's why somebody who's in Ghana who doesn't have squat, but if they know Jesus, they have everything because they have Jesus Christ. I hope you have a great Christmas. Hope you do. But keep Jesus. I know it's a cliche, but keep Christ in Christmas. Amen? All right. You bow your heads with me, please, for a second. Those who love the Lord, so welcome to the family.